Now, this is um, uh, the beginning, or near the beginning, of the story of Elijah, um, a man from uh, Tishbe, uh, and uh, he's already given a word that um, to the king, uh, Ahab, uh, that there is to be a drought. Um, you might think that's uh, wishful thinking after this summer, uh, but um, nonetheless, that was um, Elijah's word. And then it says in... Uh, in fact, in verse 7, it says, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have instructed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, um, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do all that you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For well, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. May God grant us understanding of his word. I'll guess that some of you have been uh, watching at least some of the Paralympic Games. And um, the remarkable uh, accomplishments of some of the folk. Now I'm very aware that um, uh, those uh, from uh, that community and all uh, many other parts of um, uh, areas of disability uh, don't like either the kind of patronising, oh, didn't they do well kind of attitude, or, or the, oh, my word, you have endured so much kind of thing. They say it's just life. But I look at um, some of the results uh, of the Paralympic Games and I think, and I'm not being funny here, I kind of think, good grief, there's people who have only got one leg and they're running faster than I could. People who have got immense challenges, you know, um, blind people cycling and, and uh, you know, uh, archer and people in wheelchair, archer, and it's fantastic. And yet when they are interviewed, they kind of say, well, I'm just an ordinary person. And the letter of James makes a comment about Elijah and says, Elijah was a man just like us. <laughs> Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed and the rain stopped for three years. He prayed again and the rain came. Just like us. And here's this story. Well, I'll tell you what's true about Elijah that's just like us. Not only uh, did he pray to God and the Lord answered, but the provision of God was more than enough for Elijah. As I say, it began with his proclamation to Ahab, um, an evil king, a, a king who was a bit of a despot, who, who led the nation in 
in terrible ways and into idolatry and immorality and who brought for himself over much power uh, and tyrannised the land he was supposed to serve. And Elijah feels called and he says, there will be no dew or rain except at my word, says the Lord. That's um, 1 Kings 17, 1. That's the setting for the whole of the, the story of Elijah's uh, ministry. And then as we heard that um, Elijah is sent off on a journey and he walks through the arid land to get from where he's been near the um, Kirith Brook near Tishbe up uh, to Zarephath. We've got a map. Yes, here we are. Uh, I was going to try and be really clever and get the dot to walk up or have Elijah walk up it, but you know, you've got the map there with the route. He walked in a drought 50, 60, 70 miles. Now, frankly, with the weather you got this evening, you might not much fancy walking from here to Taunton, but imagine doing it in the searing heat of a Middle Eastern drought. No water bottle to rehydrate, very little food. We begin to see a whole series of what are the problems that face the nation and the individuals within it. We've already begun to see that, that the first of the problems is the setting. Their nation is being ruled badly. Those with power see it as something of their right and to serve them. And frankly, all around the world, we hear of nations where people take power and then abuse it for their own ends, either for their egos or their pockets or those around them, their cronies. It's one of those sad things that very often um, uh, when a nation is first led uh, to a new place or a new, under new leadership, there's a period of um, high idealism and then human selfishness and sin takes over. And, and Elijah's proclamation of drought is a reminder that the Lord holds us all accountable. Now, when we're seeking to be part of his will and his purpose, that's fine. But when we put ourselves first, then God's word and God's will become a terrible, abrasive encounter. Appalling for Israel in those days, a drought the worst of things. Anyway, Elijah arrives at Zarephath, up near Sidon on the coast in the north. There's a kind of logic to what he does in one sense because you could expect that part of the land uh, to be less arid, more fertile. He's going to the place where there might be natural resources. But when he gets there, despite having been told there will be uh, this widow who will uh, resource him, he encounters that she's got problems too. Well, the first is that she's a widow. In the ancient world, that means there's no one to support her. Um, the image we've got here suggests her son was uh, quite young, probably too young to 
uh, to really to provide a living, they could well be near enough destitute. <laughs> and yet Elijah has acted obediently, which is fascinating, isn't it? He, he's acted obediently. His perception is that he should do what God tells him. Go to Zarephath and there's a widow who will support you. It's just totally counterintuitive. And that is sometimes the way the Lord chooses to work. We do things that, in a worldly sense, don't make sense. We do them because they are a way in which God chooses to provide for us. It, 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 this is something that goes right through the scriptures, of course. It will come to its pinnacle in the birth, life, teaching, death and resurrection of Jesus over and over again. It's unlikely what happens. A devout couple from an obscure town have the promise that they will bring the Messiah into the world. They go off on long journeys again, not in a drought, but they do things that look like they won't make sense. They encounter those who see a child, or rather they encounter those who meet a child and see a king and a saviour. That child, before he reaches adulthood, disappears from the family group and they find him confounding the teachers of the law. Those he meets, he says, come, follow me when disciples chose their own. To the, one of the wisest teachers in the land, uh, who asks what he must do, he says, you must be born again. To a rich man who might well have been able to support many others, Jesus says, give it all away. To a paralysed man, he says, <laughs> get up and walk. What we hear, see here is the beginnings of the stirrings of the God who works in a way that we might not. And that's often a big step of faith for us, uh, to be in step with him. The problems get further, don't they? When um, Elijah asks this woman to uh, provide for him, uh, something that's quite normal to do uh, in his culture, in, in a place where it's as quick to turn up and ask for something, including accommodation or food, as it is to let someone know in advance, because everything can only go at walking pace anyway, so you're going to walk there, and where it's normal uh, to provide for those who just turn up. Her response is to say, well... I've got a little bit of flour and a tiny bit of oil and frankly we were gathering up the sticks to nourish ourselves for a last meal. That's it. We've decided we've had it. You may think that this is a rather peculiar and long route to gladness and generosity. But there is something in this woman that understands what's going on. Somehow or the other, her discernment is, this is true. Oh, I'll do it, but it's, it's going to bring us to, an hour, to our end. The problems seem insurmountable, 
Uh, and yet she accepts the challenge to take the prophet at his word. Frankly, we're at an end. No, you're not, says Elijah. There is here a promise uh, that he makes to her. It is this promise that um, the God who has made us and who loves us uh, is the one who is more than enough. He is sufficient. When things are good, he is more than sufficient for all our needs and we need to remember that he's the giver of good things. When all seems grim and terrible, we need to remember that he is the one who is more than enough, who is sufficient to uphold us. And Elijah makes this promise. And you must wonder what it felt like for him to make this promise. God will provide. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain. I think we've got a slide with that promise on. Okay, I've kind of painted it all from the end of the widow so far. Uh, and that's quite right because um, her situation is really perilous. Can you imagine yourself making that promise as Elijah any more than being the widow to receive that promise? Here are two people who may be in the kind of harrowing situation uh, they are in, could have been expected almost to end up in that kind of gallows humour. Ha! Huh, you asked me for some bread. Look, <laughs> we got next to nothing. Well, it'll be all right. We'll be fine. Ha, ha, ha! They laugh hollowly as they think their last days and hours might be coming. But it's not like that, is it? Isn't it remarkable that uh, this... This little story tells us something of um, something much greater. This promise is going to be true. This promise will be fulfilled. There is something of the work of God's Spirit going on in this story. These people, as far as we know, the widow and Elijah have never met before, read in each other something that can be trusted. And that something that can be trusted is faith in the faithfulness of God. No matter how little we think we have for the work that we think God wants to do, if he wills it, he will ensure it's accomplished. He will resource it. And on a damp, drizzly September grey evening, when, bluntly, those of us who are here can't blame those who thought, oh, Goodness, I'm not going to go out. That same God is still at work. In you, in me, through us, at this time, in this place, for his purposes. The God who in Jesus later found some fishermen who'd had a, in fact more than once, had had a bad night's work and nothing had got there, who'd said to them, 
go on, let down the nets again, is still at work. I guess the question is, if he is true to himself and his word and his character and he is consistent and he is the God who uh, I very grandly read from the Psalms, one of those great Old Testament phrases, give thanks to the Lord for he is God, his love endures forever, his faithfulness endures forever. If we declare that, do we believe it? When Jesus first met the fishermen and they'd struggled and not caught much, when they'd heard Jesus teach, he said, put, your net, put out into some water and drop down the nets again. Well, it's got to be pretty much into the day by then when the fish are going to be sneaking down to the bottom, but Peter says, OK, I'll do it. And they catch, uh, and I think it's Luke's account, says Peter fell down and worshipped and said, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Encountering the God who does provide, who is sufficient, and who will act and accomplish what he says, can be sometimes uncomfortable. I guess three years later, when the same thing happened after the resurrection, well, Peter's response is slightly different then, isn't it? You know, it's John who says, it is the Lord, and Peter, it says, dive straight in. And then there's an uncomfortable conversation after um, uh, the barbecue fish breakfast, but nonetheless... The God who provides for the widow and the prophet is the God who in Jesus shows himself to the disciples in, and who promises, I will send you another helper, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who will speak about what I've told you. All these threads are here already in this story. In the providence of God. You'll have probably already worked out that I'm one of those people who doesn't really much like the word luck. Because it's actually a faithless word. It kind of suggests that everything is so random, it doesn't hold together. Everything in me militates against it. Uh, my science and technical background tells me that everything is about... Um, there's a sense of a spectrum of everything, a probability of everything, and a context for everything and I'll willingly have that discussion with anyone who wants it. Uh, but the faith that grew in me while I was studying at the same time tells me that if we believe in the God who is greater than all that we see and who baffles us by his glory and mystery, then he doesn't do luck either. Einstein is reputed to have said, don't gamble with God, he plays with loaded dice. Which kind of gets in the right area, doesn't it? This widow and this prophet and the widow's son discover that when they step out from the worst spectrum of point of drought and look at the probability that what little they have will be sufficient for more than one meal, they discover that in their setting it's not only one but another and another 
and another and another and another and day after day after day after day after day they are provided for when you pray says Jesus pray give us this day our daily bread and it may actually be better rendered give us today our bread for tomorrow the God who made us who cares for us is the God who provides the thing is he usually tests us right up till the last minute to make sure we're going to believe in him by not providing until the absolute last minute I know some of you have begun uh, doing something that um, uh, a colleague and friend of mine uh, began when he arrived as the minister, vicar of a, of a church that had been through a, a mighty, mighty slump uh, where several of them began praying for a new family to join the church every month. Uh, and he commented that um, more months than they, than they would have wanted it was either the last Sunday or the last day of the month when someone came. They were thinking, it's not going to happen this month. It's not going to happen. It, oh, goodness me, there is someone. How about it? How about trusting like the widow and her son? You see, if we believe uh, in the God who provides company for the journey a saviour uh, for our sin, a healer for our hurts, the spirit who forms his character within us and empowers us for his service. What on earth are we worried about praying that, in, that it might be a really good idea that some more people would join us? If we really believe what we sing and claim and read that, that, that this is a place where broken lives amended and new direction is found in the providence of God we will have cause to rejoice just like the widow and her son each day when they discovered there was still enough the God who could provide for them was the same God who in Jesus could provide for a crowd of four five ten thousand who met their needs in every aspect, their physical and spiritual and social needs together. The providence of God has not changed. He, in every area of your life where you're thinking, I don't know if I'm up to this. Sometimes it's at home, family, Sometimes it's in work uh, with someone you just can't find the way of getting on with. Sometimes it's in church. But the God who provides will provide a way. Of course, it's not the end of the story of Elijah, nor that of the, the widow. There's, there's more bits to it, isn't there? But this story ends with a reminder uh, of the nature of God. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us. He believed in the faithfulness and providence of God. He was as frail as us, 
later on, you will see him in deep depression in this story. Sometimes he felt alone. Sometimes he felt overwhelmed or defeated. But in the providence of God, there was always sufficient for all that the Lord desired to accomplish. So at the kind of, somewhere between halfway and two-thirds point of holy habits, at the, somewhere just after the beginning of a new church programme year, I guess the question for us is, how big are our dreams in God's kingdom for how big is our picture of the God in whom we claim to believe? And how much are we prepared to trust him? It's not about the size of our faith. Some years ago when we moved, um, on my first Sunday, I, off the cuff, nearly, near enough, said something which one of our delightful members there kept on quoting back to me throughout the eight years we were, we were present. It was one of those things I'd half formed at the point when I wrote it, but since I've come to realise there's a real truth in it, so I might as well say it again. You see, it's not the size of your faith that counts, but it's the greatness of the God in whom you put what little faith you have. That's what this story is about. A somewhat erratic prophet who walks uh, 50 miles because God tells him to and asks the most unlikely person to help him and of that most unlikely person who is destitute and on the end of tether also thinks okay the prophet of God asks me he says it'll be all right I'll do it I wonder what things you will encounter this week, this month, this year, that will require what little faith you have to be put in a God big enough to accomplish and provide. And I wonder if by this time next year we were to gather and share the stories of what God has been doing how Jesus has been shown and shared. I wonder if we each took those little steps. Just imagine what there might be to share. And by way of a taster, may I remind you that the end of this month, on the 29th, is one of our um, praise and share evenings where in in the words of uh, Leonard Sachs uh, from the good old days uh, this will be chiefly yourselves uh, when the opportunity comes in between the music to offer a word of testimony I wonder what will the Lord have been doing in the next three or four weeks, what will he do in the next year and the years that are to come? For here's the thing, no matter the problems, his promise is sure and his providence is steadfast. So let's pray.